Testing, 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 testing. tap green your live.
Hello? Yep, that's fine. Perfect.
Okay, we'll get underway. Let me welcome everyone to our Friday night presentation. Let me bring up our slides. Okay, we'll start off then with our upcoming, upcoming meetings. September 15th, next Friday, is another photojournalism night. The deadline for that is usually uh, two days before, 48 hours before, so you have lots of time really to submit your uh, pictures. So that's next Friday. Then coming up, September 22nd, is our nature competition again, projection. Um, deadline is on the website. September 29th is, uh, let's start, get those pictures in. That is our fourth critique night. They have been very, very popular in the past. Send up to three images. Just send them. You don't have to downsize them or do anything to info at clevelandphoto.org. This is, again, no judging allowed. This is purely, we're going to have a panel of CPS uh, members. We'll be able to manipulate your images on screen at the same time. So if we're going to show maybe cropping or this or that, we'll do it there. Images, these, no restrictions. They could have been done any time. There could be images you're really happy with, things you have questions about, anything you want some constructive criticism on. Um, the audience will participate as well. It's kind of just an open night, and people have found it very useful. So just send up to three images to info at clevelandphoto.org, and I will get you in the queue. And October 6th is our first B competition, which will be projection. That is for our beginners. New competition rules. We talked about that last time. I think we have, I'm getting it shaky. They are in effect. They are not yet. They are almost in effect. So to get it, so what you're going to see on our website, again, to deal with AI, the competition committee has put in an enormous amount of time. We've gotten a lot of feedback on this to get us up and running with some rules in the AI era. Um, so the proposed rules are on the website. You can find it on our homepage. Uh, if you want to send a comment, you can. But even if they're about to go live and the real ones, you could look over to see probably what the almost finished product is so you get a jump on really just understanding what the new rules are going to, uh, going to be. So that's up on our website uh, now. OK, I know there were a lot of people there at the air show because I was there. So I know there are a lot of pictures floating around because people afterwards were telling me, oh, I took 8,000 or 9,000 or whatnot. So, you know, so there's no excuse you can't send me three or four or something like that. Send them in to the info at clevelandphoto.org for the, the, the website gallery. I mean, we all learn from that. I mean, I was there. I have some beautiful sky pictures. It would be nice if they had a jet in them, but basically is... You know, and, and I'd like to see things I got that I missed and how other people got their shots and other views that they took. So um, send them in. We'll, we'll put them all up again. Upcoming field trips uh, next week is Back to the Wild, always very, uh, very popular. SIG meeting. Our next SIG meeting, October 5th with Dave Bush, first Thursday of the month is going to be on everything you want to know about lenses and filters. I mean, questions such as, you know, the off-brand, the Sigma, are they as good? What are some limitations of certain lenses, you know, about filters? And speaking of the SIG meetings, as of last night's SIG meeting, um, Dave is having them now videotaped. So the SIG meetings are, uh, starting last night, we videotaped that one where he talked on his Route 66 trip and that is up on our website on our member portal. So sign in, go to the member portal, and where all the video, the Zoom recordings are too, you will now see the SIG meetings as well. And Dave's SIG meeting from last night is up. Portraiture and lighting course uh, starting this Sunday. John Soraya is giving that. He hasn't done that in a few years. We have uh, one spot left. So if anyone wanted to sign up, you could still do that and be ready to start on Sunday. It's for three Sundays. 
uh, from 10 to 1 p.m. There'll be models there, and you can sign up through our website. And as always, uh, this meeting and all of our public meetings are on our YouTube site, CPS YouTube site, and to get to it is, remember, if you go to the home page, and in the upper right portion, there's a YouTube icon. You click on that. It takes you to the YouTube page, and from there, make sure you click on Live, which is kind of counterintuitive, and that'll show you all the CPS uh, meetings in date order, and you could watch our meetings there. So, without further ado, as I switch over videos, uh, tonight we are really, really lucky to have an old club member. No, that's the wrong wording. <laughs> we are lucky to have a former club member who is not that old, Susan Anisko back. Um, and Susan is, I've been a fan, even though she doesn't know it, I've been a fan of hers for a long time. When I joined in 2017, I had already seen, a, because I do a lot of travel photography, so I was exceptionally drawn to yours and tremendous images. Um, I read your blog, things of that sort, so I knew of Susan back then. Um, Susan is going to tell you a little bit about herself too, but um, you go to her website, her work is incredible. During COVID, uh, travel photography kind of was put by the wayside, and I know you did a lot of the cosplay thing, and that's where you got into wildlife, and can tell us about that. So, as I switch over the video, I'd like to give you uh, Susan Anisko now. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Awesome. Yes. There's a reason why, right? Pockets. I think we're all set. Well, thank you guys so much for having me back. Um, some of you I know from quite a while ago. I was a member here, goodness, about 15 to 20 years ago. Um, I started out at camera clubs in the area. I started out at Akron Camera Club and then I came here. And I think I was here 2007, 2010 maybe, right around there. And I, you know, at first I was bringing photos of my kids. And let me tell you, I needed some work on my photography. <laughs> so I went on a travel photography workshop with a professional <laughs> photographer. And I got, You're fine. I'm good, okay. I will not move so much. <laughs> and um, I, I took pictures on that trip. It was a trip to Michigan and my photos there got better, really good. And then my kids' pictures got better. And all of a sudden uh, I started doing competitions here, selling my prints, doing uh, portraits and weddings locally. And you know how it is, like this is my family and uh, going different places. My son was getting his ears cleaned in China. You know, everything becomes a photo trip, right? Your family is very supportive of you. You know, your husband carries your camera bag, holds lights for you. Um, I have, uh, when I started, I was pregnant with my fourth child. And as of two weeks ago, just want you to know, I'm an empty nester now. I sent my youngest off to college. So I definitely need to update some of these photos. But when I was doing travel photography, I really was drawn to photographing people, um, people in interesting places. It was kind of shocking to me because I'm kind of quiet by nature. <laughs> and for me to go up in the beginning, and I, I would just kind of stand back with a long lens and kind of take sniper shots of people, right? Getting their like natural expressions and moments. And then all of a sudden, I don't know what happened. I get nervous talking in a group, but somehow I can talk to anybody in the world and get their picture. But when I did travel photography, it was great because it gave me a great base in all sorts of photography, landscape, fine art, macro, even a little wildlife. But like I said, I was photographing portraits and weddings locally. And I just wanted to do something more when I was at home. And as a mom of four kids, it was really hard to travel, come home, 
and then it'll be what the 4th of July and I'm like oh kids let's do oh I can't do that with you kids because I have to pack my van to do a wedding tomorrow and I really wanted something I could do with my my family on the weekends and something more interesting than you know portraits and weddings of normal people and that's when my kids took me to my first comic-con and that was uh, Cleveland Wizard World gosh maybe back in 2015 16 took a few years to figure out what I wanted to do, but I went to this convention and I saw all these amazing people dressed in cosplay. And I was on the floor with my camera and I was like, they deserve more, right? These are like rock stars. I mean, can you tell that that's not the real Spock up there? I mean, and, and these people sew their own costumes, they 3D print props, they do their makeup. You know, they're absolutely amazing. And my kids brought me into this world, and uh, so now I'm working on a book called Cosplay 50, The United States of Cosplay. So what we do is we take a full studio and a sprinter, and we drive from state to state and go to different comic conventions. And I pick the best people off the floor, whether they look like the character, or maybe they're just super creative and what they did with their costume was unreal. And, th and then I bring them in and take their picture. So we're gonna be on state number 33 next year, I think. And once we get to 50, I will make the book. So this project started out as basically my family. They were my assistants at these conventions. And it's kind of grown over the years. Some of my travel friends ended up being my assistants and they'd meet me in different states to do the cons. And, but now, thankfully, this guy right here is my assistant at all the cons now, which is wonderful for me because I'm not getting any younger or stronger. <laughs> but back in 2019, I think we were up to about 20 states and then COVID hit. And what happened was conventions definitely shut down, right? Thousands of people there. And all my travel around the world, the people I wanted to photograph, they were all in masks. And I was sitting at home and pretty depressed, and I was like, well, what, what can I do now, right? And the only thing I could think of was that, you know, wildlife, they have eyes. It's kind of like portraits, right? Being outside with wildlife should be super safe during the pandemic. And I figured it'd probably be about three years. I'm like, we'll get vaccinated quickly, but what about the rest of the world? And that's when I decided to go into wildlife photography. So tonight we're gonna to talk about what I've done pretty much the last three years. Um, as you can tell, my, my fashion sense has taken a toll, right? I wear a lot of neutral colors now. Um, you know, some great waders, some nice boots these days. But yeah, we're gonna talk about the world of wildlife. And it's very similar to when I was shooting people and travel portraits. One of the most important thing is moments. You know, you wait for them, right? I love po We are just going to Actually, replace the... Uh, you want me to just put it up here, maybe, if I oh, don't sure. want to try this? Yep. Mm -hmm. I'll take this one off. Okay, better? No cricky crackies? Okay. So, um, yeah, moments, they're everywhere, right? And with our camera, we have to be quick and capture these moments. Whether you're coming down the bank of the river in Alaska and you see this mom and bear and the baby bear is playing with a stick, or, you know, you have a cheetah baby <laughs> yawning and you're shooting, you know, a high frame rate and you capture this thing while it looks like it's smiling and laughing at you. Sometimes you'll sit with a bear in Alaska and you know you feel kind of sorry for her. It's her first year out and she's trying to get on her own and she's trying to catch a fish and she's doing everything possible. This poor bear even laid in the water with her mouth open, hoping that a fish would swim into it. And then you know, after like an hour to an hour and a half, she got so mad she just stood up and started bashing at the water. And those are the moments that we hope for in wildlife makes the photo a lot more interesting. 
So I started going to Alaska. You know, we're going to talk about Africa, but there's something to say about the North American safari, okay? I've been to Alaska the last five years, except for 2020, to shoot bears, and it stills your heart up there, right? Every year I go back, there's different things going on. You know, the seasons change a little differently, a little earlier with the fall colors. When I started going, I started shooting like a 100 to 400, 200 to 500. It was easy to carry because you're hiking and stuff. And it, it was great. It gave me a lot of versatility. But the nice thing about going back to places is that you can experiment more. So the last year, when I went to Alaska, I actually took an 800 millimeter lens to hike with. OK, but it's right. I'm mirrorless now, so it's not so heavy. Now, I missed a lot of shots that trip, but I got a lot of interesting shots, like this one on the right, your left. <laughs> I used to teach aerobics. I'm very bad with right and left. <laughs> but you'll see the really pretty painterly background there. That's with my 800 lens at 5.6. And it just destroyed the backgrounds. It made these images look so much different. Just like when I photograph people, visualizing moments, right? You know, we were driving around uh, looking at this leopard, and we, I was like, oh, there's those beautiful rocks up there. Wouldn't it be amazing if he got on those rocks? Now, it doesn't always happen, but it did here. And we took the shot, and it's one of my favorites. So we shoot with long lenses. That's been a change for me. I used to be a 70 to 200 girl. And when you shoot with an 800, it's interesting. You have such a narrow field of view. So if there's like a group of giraffes, um, you can't see everything. But luckily in Africa, you have wonderful guides. And they keep eyes out for you, and they know animal behavior much better than we do. And so as I was shooting some giraffes, my guide said, they're going to kiss. And you know, you can imagine me fumbling around with my camera trying <laughs> to figure out where these giraffes were. And once I did, I took the shot. But I always talk about the importance of having guides in different countries. They keep us safe. They know the language. You know, but in Africa, it takes on whole new meaning because they actually really help you with your photographs. Same thing here. Um, I never saw lions in trees before. I've seen lion cups in trees. But for male lions to get into a tree like that, it's not a pretty sight, OK? <laughs> they, they struggled. <laughs> And it was interesting because we were um, in, in a safari vehicle following these lions. And there was a couple other vehicles, and they were staying close to the lions. And it was the first day I had this guide, and he took off. And I was like, what are we doing? We're leaving the lions. And he was like, no, 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 no. And so we pulled in front of this tree, and it turned out that um, two nights previously, these lions had taken the same course and jumped in the same tree, except they did it a lot later when no one could get a photo of them. So we got super, super lucky. And it always reminds me of the importance of guides. <laughs> OK, now I know I'm going to screw this up. I phonetically wrote this out. Mega Degati. I'm going to say that. Salt pans in Botswana. You know, how do you get the shot? You know, I'm thinking, oh, it's, it's pretty much luck, right? But did anybody watch Meerkat Manor? OK, Magogo? Yeah, that one on the right is Magogo. <laughs> and what happens is um, there's a few places in the world where you can go and there's habituated meerkats. Okay, and what this means is they're, they're used to people. But they actually have like a meerkat habituator come out. Like at first they bring a car out to the dens and get the meerkats used to the car. Then they get outside the car. Then they get closer to the den. And so these, these meerkats have no, no fear of people, which is great. And uh, as for them all looking the same way, that was luck. But they come out every morning and do this right at the sun. Backgrounds in any type of photography is important, right? Especially wildlife photography. And sometimes that's not so easy. Um, this was my first trip to Rwanda in 2021 uh, to see the mountain gorillas. And we all know the problem with jungles, right? It's all that splotchy light coming through. And what can you do? I mean, you reduce your highlights and post and whites. 
that you really have to look for a better background. So oftentimes that means just getting lower. When we get lower to the ground, there's not as much sky, and so there's not a, as much of those leafy highlights. Um, and what's closest to the ground? Little, little, little ones, sub-adults, little baby gorillas. And I don't know if a lot of people who come here show you before and afters, but I always think it's important. Like, you know, sure, sometimes you get the perfect image out of camera, but lots of times it's not that way, right? We crop. Same with this. Cropping is very important when you do the mountain gorillas because you have to stay so far away from them, right? I think the rule with COVID was 30 feet. Now, they tell you on your first, when you go out, you have to stay 30 feet away from the gorillas. But the gorillas, they go where they want. So my, like, my very first time out with the mountain gorillas, I was sitting down, and there was this gorgeous silverback. And you know, they said, stay low. I'm like, OK. And so I start shooting. And he comes right toward me. And you can't do anything. You have to sit there right, and stay calm. Don't make eye contact. And I felt like my guide's arms like on my shoulders kind of holding me down. Not like I was going to bolt. I listened to directions very, very well. But the silverback came up, and he literally brushed his whole body up against my side and kept on walking. So <laughs> they can come next to you, but you can't go next to them. And uh, that's why cropping is so important. It's amazing what comes in handy that you learned years ago. I used to take the family, um, uh, family holiday portrait, you know, sitting like four kids down trying to get them all to look at the camera at the same time, 300 frames and not one of all four of them looking at the camera. So I quickly learned a head swap years ago. And you know, no joke, I'm still doing it. Couldn't get this baby and mom to look at me at the same time. But I'm not like a photojournalist. I'm not a documentary photographer. You know, I aim to make pretty photos to put on the walls. So this is what it's like hiking in Rwanda. You're at like about 8,000 to 10,000 feet. Um, this one day, you probably hike about one to four miles uh, a day. And then this one day was particularly hard because the gorilla family we were seeing was down in a crater. And so it was great. You know, going up is actually the easy part, okay? When you go down, it's muddy and slippery. And so what the guides would do is they'd put their feet out like this. And then I do like a, a slide into them. And then they'd stop me with their feet and then their hands, and then we'd do it again. And that's how I got into the crater. And it was pretty difficult, <laughs> but it was so worth it. You know why? Because the backgrounds, no longer I was down in a crater. No longer did I have those splotchy backgrounds. Now I had like beautiful, lush greenery behind it. Lots of uh, wildlife, especially leopards. I mean, they're always in trees, right? Which is beautiful. That's their, their normal place. But it's really hard, even with the most beautiful of tree, to get one without highlights behind it. So I try to look for my leopards on the ground with a beautiful background behind them. Or I look for, for critters in interesting places. And I used to have, um, every presentation I used to do, I had this big slide full of like plugins that I like to use, OK? And I'd usually take stuff into Photoshop, use the plugin, mask things out. And I had this big workflow. And it's amazing now with Lightroom and how far it's come. You know, mainly I use Lightroom presets now. And they've made masking so easy in Lightroom. You know, I go into Photoshop for like heavy, heavy work. Or I still find that Photoshop has the best spot healing or cloning stamp. Still can't get that. I don't know if you guys have had that. I still can't get it to look right in Lightroom. I don't know what it is. But so I use Photoshop for that. But as far as backgrounds go, sometimes you just get super lucky. Then you shoot wildlife for a few years, and you go, you know what I need? I really need a 600 millimeter f4 lens. And when you've, if you've never shot with this lens, it will blow your mind, OK? It is expensive. It is 
so worth it, I can't tell you. I mean, this is shot at f4. And all I've done here is I think I desaturated the image. I just lightened it up a bit. But that's how your, weed, your, your grasses and your weeds look. And you know, I have two kids out of college now, so it's OK. So a lot of wildlife photography is dependent on um, what time of year you go. Uh, the first time I went to Botswana to the Okavanga Delta was in June, and that's when the floods from Angola comes in. And it's, it's gorgeous, um, but you get a lot of bright blue skies, and it's pretty cool. It's kind of like winter there almost. It's like 40 degrees in the mornings. It warms up quickly, though. <laughs> but that's what, that's what you do. It's almost like you have an amphibious vehicle. But I got this in that first trip to Botswana, and I love this image. I love the clouds. I love the lights. Uh, there was just a stormy storm coming in. And my guide told me that you should really come back in March or April. That's when we get all the stormy skies here. And so that's what I did. Now, it's a lot harder during that time of year because um, there's a lot of greenery, a lot of grass. So it's harder to find animals. But when you find them, you get just beautiful backgrounds. This was taken in misty mornings. I think this was in October. And I never thought I'd get a giraffe in Africa in the mist. Woke up to this one morning. I was hoping a giraffe would walk through. But we just got impalas. But it's still beautiful. And this Cape Buffalo glow and these cattle egrets. All we did this morning was we changed our location. It's the same morning as the other picture. And then I just changed my white balance to cloudy and got this nice, warm, painterly portrait of them. But can you guys imagine this scene without the clouds? Like, it, it just wouldn't, it wouldn't be that great, right? So for me, when I, well, actually, ever since the beginning of the time <laughs> that I photographed, I'm always quality over quantity. I'd rather get 20 images of a beautiful animal with beautiful clouds and scenery rather than 500 images of blue sky with a cat in it. So we'll talk a little on Antarctica. Some of you may have seen this photo from years ago. Um, I went on a cruise to Antarctica in 2013, which was wonderful. It was on Quark. My husband really wanted to go. And at the time, I was photographing people. And I'm like, OK. But I went, and I loved it, because it was just beautiful. And I fell in love with little penguins. And this kind of image is key for me. I love simplicity, right? You know, your eye knows exactly where to go in the frame. There's no distracting elements around it. And interesting, uh, photography is the art of subtraction, right? So we're taking these big scenes and chaos and making them pretty, basically. Because that's what the scene really looked like. And that's what the photo my husband took. So you guys can all imagine, I was on the ground. Tip for Antarctica, if you guys go in December, it's snowy and beautiful. If you go in January, you get little chicks, which are adorable, but the snow melts, and there's penguin poop everywhere. And that's what that is. And I had, I, to get that previous photo, you know what I had to do, right? I had to lay in penguin poop. But it was worth it, because I'd rather that hanging on my wall than this. <laughs> but when you go on a cruise to Antarctica, the only hard thing is it's all weather dependent, OK? So if you make landings, which we were lucky when we went, we got, uh, went on, we got landings every day um, because we had good weather. Um, but sometimes you don't. And when you get on land, you can only spend an hour, like an hour on land. So that's tough, right? We want to spend tons of time with those penguins. So I found a trip last year that went to Antarctica. And you camped on the ice with emperor penguins. And so me and my crazy girlfriend, <laughs> we decided to do this. And uh, it was quite the adventure. It was a pretty pricey adventure. We spent about, I think, four nights in a, in, on the ice with Emperor Penguin Colony. Okay, 
Uh, you fly in from Punta Arenas in uh, Chile. And the problem is, again, this is all weather dependent. So the trip was scheduled to be like, I think, seven to nine days long. And we ended up being down there for about three weeks because there was a week delay getting out because the weather wasn't good and we couldn't fly to Antarctica. And you fly on a normal 737, it's really freaky. Um, but eventually we got out. There was 10 of us. By the time we got out, it was getting close to Thanksgiving and six of our group left. They didn't even want to go anymore. <laughs> but we stuck it out. We went. We thought we were all adventurous. And um, your first stopping point in Antarctica is Union Glacier. And you quickly realize that as far as adventures go, you're at the, the bottom of the pecking order, right? Because this company that runs this trip is called Antarctic Logistics and Expeditions, I believe. And what they do is everybody you hear about who's like walking across Antarctica, skiing across Antarctica, solo, unsupported, a group, they all go through this company. And so we were down there. Woo, we're going to camp on the ice with emperor penguins. And these people are spending three months in Antarctica. OK? But I still thought we were pretty adventurous. So when the weather improves, so that's at Union Glacier, and that's kind of like the base camp where all their trips go off from. Um, we got on another plane and went to Gould Bay, which is on the Ron Ice Shelf. And it's about a mile from the Emperor Penguin Colony. So we stayed in mountaineering tents, and they had like a kitchen area, which was heated, and they made food, and then you had bathrooms at the camp. Um, and what you do three times a day is you take your sled with all your camera gear and warm gear in case you got stuck out there um, and put it on your sled, probably about 40 pounds, and you'd walk to and from three times a day. So you were doing six miles a day. It was, it was pretty hard, I must say. This is the little tent I stayed in. But yeah, there was definitely a reward. Like, these emperors are gorgeous. I love the graphic quality of them. Um, you know, the time, by the time we got there, they weren't the, the little, little baby ones that were on the feet. They were a little older, but they were, they, they, they were very comedic by that age. They had a lot of personality. And you think it's easy to shoot with a penguin colony, right? But when you think about it, they're all kind of clumped together. So you're always on the outskirts trying to get the clean backgrounds and everything. And uh, it, was, it was pretty challenging. In the end, what I started doing is I started using other penguins as frames to try to get something different. Another great uh, North American safari. Has anybody been to Churchill? It's beautiful. Um, I went with Churchill Wild up there, and we actually flew further north than Churchill and went to Seal River Heritage Lodge. And why I wanted to go there, it was my crazy girlfriend again, actually. It was her 40th birthday. And we wanted to go on the ground with polar bears. And this company does that. And it's absolutely amazing. They have a lodge up there. It's really good food. Oh. It's very comfortable. There's an electric fence around it. They have a watchtower where they go up and can look out for the bears. And then you just suit up, and then you hike out to the bears and take their pictures. The most interesting thing about the trip, sure, we had a bear guide. He had a gun. He never had to use it. Like A bear got close, and he threw a rock next to it, and it ran away. But the most interesting thing to me was that it was all about bear behavior, which I hadn't really thought about, right? You see a skinny bear, you don't go by the skinny bear. OK, pretty logical, right? Um, you see a bear sleeping on its stomach, you stay away from it. Because the bear sleeping on its side is much safer because it takes more to get up from its side. Whereas if it's got its claws underneath them, he can just spring forward, and polar bears are very fast. So this was something I found fascinating. And I love the images I got there. It was, you know, I looked over at my girlfriend at one point, and she just had tears streaming down her face. It was such a beautiful sight. But I was really afraid that I wouldn't see a bear on this trip. So I actually booked two back-to-back -back polar bear trips. Um, and it was a, with good reason. One of the tr women on our first trip on the ground, she had went the previous year, and they didn't see a bear. 
So there's no guarantees with wildlife ever. Um, she saw a lot of Arctic foxes, and she saw Arctic hares and got great shots of them, but she never saw a polar bear, so she had to come back the next year. But I, I padded in time. <laughs> I wanted to go on the tundra buggy also. I was really afraid that um, on the tundra buggy you'd be photographing straight down, right? I really wanted to get eye level with the bears. That's why I went on the, the walking safari like a crazy person. But to my surprise, I love my images from the tundra buggy also. So we actually did the tundra buggy lodge. Um, I, I, if you've seen the, the tundra buggies, they're like school buses with monster truck wheels. And you can go out from Churchill each day on those. Um, but they also have a lodge, which is like a, a train of school buses that they've gutted and put like a kitchen and bunk beds, and you can actually sleep out there. And it's really cool because um, you're closer to the bears that way. So you actually get more time with the bears if you stay out there. And I did their end of the year, it's like called Cape Churchill, where they actually take the tundra buggy down and they move it to a different location where the bears are going off onto the ice. So you get a bigger congregation of bears, which is interesting. And it's mostly photographers that go on that. And the nice thing about the tundra buggy was the fact that they could go further. Like the whole time I was on the ground, we never saw cubs. But because I went on the tundra buggy and they could go out and search more, we actually <laughs> found polar bear cubs. And they were beautiful. So I'll talk a little bit about high key images. Um, I've always loved high key images. Uh, in 2020, me and my youngest, we were in Japan when that COVID cruise ship just started over there. We were visiting my sister there and photographing these red crown cranes and uh, the little the snow monkeys. And I'd been there before, and I really wanted, again, to get more of a graphic image, something that you look at and, you know, you say, what? No, that, I know that's a red crown crane, but could that be a dagger, right? Could it be a treble clef? I love images that make you think. For me, I saw a treble clef, and I called this lyrical. So for high-key images, you know, when you go on safari, you go out early in the morning at sunrise, and then by about 10 o'clock, the light's getting a little, a little harsh for photos. And I'm always looking for something in the shade. Um, and that's great. But you know, as photographers, we really need to try to shoot all day <laughs> in any type of light, right? So one of my guides taught me how to do high-key images on zebras, which are the perfect subject. Um, behind these guys, it was just brown. It was like brown dirt. And so I overexposed the image in camera here. Um, the image is also copied and flipped in Photoshop to give it more of that pano effect. Um, you know, I just usually overexpose, like in, if you're in aperture priority, plus two, plus three, somewhere around there to get an image like this. But if you shoot in RAW, um, you can probably do most of this in post because there's a lot of latitude when you're shooting RAW with exposure. Get a lot of, oh, don't shoot if it's a you know, cloudy gray sky, whatever. Why not? I mean, I love this giraffe. Like, it looks like a poster I put on my wall. And uh, again, I just overexpose the image here. Yeah, isn't he cute? <laughs> And I always like to try, um, you know, this is one of my things from the beginning. I always try things vertical, but I also try horizontal just to see what it'd look like. So again, you know, the sun gets a little harsh. What are you going to do? I mean, you know, we're getting really lucky with uh, Lightroom and everything where you can mask your subject and invert and mask the background and play around with the exposures of each and everything. But, you know, this is the shot out of camera. <coughs> I overexposed these, left one in color and turned one to black and white. And, you know, that I'd hang on my wall. You know, this image, probably not. And, you know, this image is out of camera. It's a pretty crappy image, I'm going to admit. You know, it was quick. We turned a corner, and this elephant was doing it. And of course, I took a picture, and then he stopped doing it and never did it again. 
but I really wanted to save this image. So um, I like to shoot infrared. I actually have an infrared uh, Z9 now. And unfortunately, it's very hard when you're on Safari to handle three camera bodies. <laughs> so I didn't have it out. So I just used the preset in Lightroom here and converted the one to infrared. And then I really liked it, but I was like, oh, I like the green of the trees too. So I sandwiched these two in Photoshop and then brought some of the greens back. And that's how I got the other image. So I'm always playing with this high key effect. Um, you know, this tunnel, tunnel like views of animals where you have bright highlights behind them and uh, the tree around them. I, I love the bokeh and the tree and everything. You know, I tried it in high key and I actually really liked it a lot more. Uh, Pangolin Chobi, you ever go to Botswana, the Chobi, they have a great hotel there. They also have houseboats you can go out on. And then they have little um, boats you go out on, whether you stay in the hotel. And it's like playing a video game. They have like, they spin, and then your camera's on a thing that spins. And so it's like you're playing, you know, some kind of weird space game shooting the animals. <laughs> but high key images, again, this is, um, we got a call, we were in Africa and Botswana, and there was a mom cheetah and five cubs, and that's a really rare sight, especially these cubs were almost to, uh, grown to adulthood. And so we were like an hour and a half away, we drove there, we found these guys. Um, usually mama cheetahs, maybe one or two cubs will make it to adulthood. So this was a great sight to see. She was a wonderful mother, and we got there, we stopped the car, it was you know, probably around four o'clock and these guys were just waking up from their nap in the shade. And this isn't a great picture. I, we followed these cheetahs, I took it just as a snapshot. And we followed these cheetahs all night while they hunted and finally they killed something, and the, but it was dark. And it was the only other time that all these cheetahs were together in the same frame again. So I thought, this is my photo. What am I going to do with it? So I turned it high key in post, and it hangs on my wall. So we talked about high key, we talk about low key, also super interesting. You know, I look for light um, on my animal and dark backgrounds, usually dark green. And I just underexpose the images. You know, these are shot. This is a shot that normally I wouldn't even take but I was playing with this low key effect and I'm like, you know, I kind of like the, it's almost like a gobo in studio lighting, you know, where we shoot through shapes, cast down on him. And you really get to see that um, when you underexpose it. Close ups, it's like the required Africa shot, you know, an elephant's eye. Sometimes you get close ups that you don't mean to get this was, I was in the water in Alaska, and this bear just got closer and closer, and I was in the water by myself, and I just, people were around me, but pretty far away, and I just knelt down and was like, oh. And this was like, I just pointed my 500 and took a quick shot. <laughs> like, That's a pretty close bear, giving me the eye. Uh, giraffes, we were at a watering hole, and the, this giraffe was far off drinking. And I took the wide shots. Giraffes are really cool. Like they, they're very vulnerable when they go down. They spread their legs and they go down. And when they come up, they kind of flip the water up. And so you get these beautiful rain or water drops in the air. Uh, and I got some of those shots and I was happy. And I'm like, what else can I do? And I took out my, uh, the 600 F4, which has a teleconverter in it that goes to 840 at 5.6. And so I took that out and I started kind of doing the same thing I did with the elephant eye, but wanting to do that with a giraffe eye. And I love that I have the pattern of the giraffe right behind it. Fine art, wildlife photography, I don't really know what it is. I just think it's stuff that I like that looks good. Um, <laughs> it's in a, me and my girlfriend were in uh, the safari vehicle in Botswana and this leopard was on the other side. And I asked the guide, I said, can I scooch over? You know, you always ask, right? Leopards jump. And he said, of course. And I put my camera up to my eye and I was shooting and I started to scoot over and this leopard just went whoop <laughs> and looked straight at me. And luckily I was able to shoot, but I was really trying to get that green grass out of the frame. 
And, but obviously I didn't try anymore. I was okay. <laughs> so in post, I started playing and um, converted this to black and white, which I really liked. And then I started playing with uh, the blending modes in Photoshop. And it was really interesting to me, um, the multiply blending mode totally got rid of that grass. I mean, to do that in Photoshop would have been quite an epic event. And by using the multiply um, blending mode, it totally went away. What is this elephant doing? Is he sleeping? Did he have a bad day? No, he was actually eating the bark off the side of the tree. You know, like things to me that say a fine art feel to them, um, you know, single subject frames, right? The sleeping beach beauty there. And I love the bear with the fish in his mouth. I love the composition of this and the color and everything kind of all worked together in that scene. And you know, the bear's not looking at me. I don't have eye contact, it's nothing like that. Um, I just love how it, it all kind of blends together. It's like perfectly balanced for me. I did this crop earlier, I think, with the polar bears. I love these kind of crops. Um, you know, beautiful light on the cat, beautiful clouds behind. Groups. I'm a sucker for moms and babies, okay? <laughs> and uh, I uh, started traveling um, over the pandemic with Susie Esterhaus, and I don't know if any of you follow her, but she is like the mom and baby animal photographer. She does beautiful stuff. Um, I desaturated this image here, give it a gentler feel. Love these two in Alaska. Who doesn't love baby bears, right? Running through flowers, of course. And then sometimes you get really lucky. The, uh, when you drive in Africa and you stop at animals, you know, before you stop, they usually look up. But after they turn off the car, it's like, <gasps> and then they run, okay? So <laughs> I've learned that if I keep the camera up, <laughs> sometimes I will get the shot. And this, what, this time, these little guys, they were like perfectly spaced and all their heads were turned the right way. It was a miracle. Um, cheetahs are usually pretty hard to find in Africa. And I put these in here. Um, if you're gonna go searching for cheetahs somewhere, we were at Pinda, Pinda Lodge in South Africa. And that's the best place to find cheetahs. But like I said, usually cheetahs are like this. They have like one baby or two. Not that big fest we saw before. But we're back to where the uh, meerkats were. And it was super interesting this morning. We went out and our guide was like, he saw something in the distance and he was making a big fuss over it and I didn't know what it was. And uh, he's like, oh my gosh, we never see these here. And uh, this line of elephants started coming through the pans. And I'm not a videographer, but there are some times where I wish I did video and this was one time. So these salt pans are dry, right? And these giant elephants are walking toward us. We actually got out of the vehicle and on the ground next to the, the wheels of the tires of the vehicle to get a low angle on them. And they were still pretty far away. But all you could hear was this light crunch, like a gentle crunch in the, in, in the salt pan as they went by. And it's all you heard anywhere. And uh, it was the most magical sound. So one of my favorite quotes in photography is people we love pattern, but interrupted pattern is much more interesting. And Jay Maisel said that, and I always have to agree. These guys are great walking, right? All the same way. That one little guy looks at you and you're like, oh. So unlovable, you know. I don't mean that these animals are unlovable, but sometimes they are overlooked in the wildlife photography world. So I just want to put that disclaimer out there. I love these animals. Warthogs. You know, warthogs and hyenas, they got a bad rap. The Lion King really ruined them. Um, I'm hoping they make a remake, you know, and make, make uh, the hyenas the hero. 
of the story. But these guys are so cute. They back into these little holes. And, and you know, I'm going to tell you why this guy was actually zooming out of the hole. And I was super excited that I photographed him. And, but I'm going to share a secret, and that's I missed the two babies that went out right after him. They were super tiny little babies zooming around. Warthog families, come on, the little baby looking through. Dung beetles, come on, okay? They're the actual superheroes of the safari. So the funny thing is you'll be driving around at night and all of a sudden you get dunked in the head and these things are huge. They remind me of hummingbirds when they fly. So why not go on the ground and, you know, take some photos of them in their environment? Impalas. They're kind of like the feeding fi the feeder fish if you've ever had snakes and all those kind of things, um, the feeder fish of the savanna. And uh, I just think they're the sweetest little creatures. So the light was getting harsh this one day. So I started playing with shooting through the grasses and finding them in good light with dark backgrounds. And this is what I came up with. Rhinos. I'm actually so thrilled that I went to Botswana in 2021. So over the pandemic, a lot of the rhinos, um, you know, they were, they were killed for their horns and the population went really down. And now when you go, um, I know South Africa has dehorned their rhinos now uh, to stop poaching. And I think Botswana is doing the same thing. So I really got some of the last wild images of them with horns. Do you know what this is? It's a hyena. It's a brown hyena. And um, now the Lion King, I think, was spotted hyenas. Now, they look a little different. But these guys are like the fluffy German Shepherd hyena mix, right? They are so cute. Luck of the wide. I don't take a lot of wide angle shots uh, on, uh, with wildlife. I, I think it's hard. I think it's hard to find groups of animals that have nice spacing and, and, and that work, right? Everything has to work together, the group of animals, the background, and the sky. And, and I just find that really difficult. So I'm really happy when I get some wide angle shots I like. I seem to always carry like a 16 to 35 with me and I never use it. The widest I think I usually shoot is 24 to 120. <coughs> I love the scene. It was uh, delicate clouds, you know, painterly background. I love these guys. I always look for separation. The four elephants are separated. There's four palm trees in the back. It just balances out well. Like I said, I use a lot of Lightroom presets and kind of play around with different color toning. And just so you know, in these images, I cleaned up so much elephant dung. It was all over here. I mean, you can still kind of see some of the, the dots further off, but don't think these scenes are perfect. They never are. But sometimes you get really lucky. And you guys can ask questions at any time. I should have probably said that in the beginning, but feel free or after. Um, I love multiple exposure. I'm always looking for something. I don't know. I, I think I just get bored. Okay. That's why I shoot so many different subjects in photography. I have like photographer ADD. Um, and the same with shooting subjects. I, you know, sometimes just a static portrait just doesn't do it for me, and I want to do something else. So red crown cranes here. Um, I always have dreams when I go places like beautiful snow coming down, you know, and the birds flying in gracefully. And, you know, that's the reality of it, right? You know, they feed the red crown cranes at 2 o'clock. You get there at 150, you pay your entrance fee, you set up your tripod, and you get them flying in. And no snow, and I was very sad. So... I played with multiple exposure. It's a lot harder years ago. Um, 
Um, basically, I was on a tripod here. I um, went to a 30th of a second shutter speed. I um, just moved the camera upwards to kind of give those trees in the background a softer feel. And then I looked for red crown cranes that had separation. I took that shot, and then it merged them together in camera. And I don't quite know what this white thing was. I kind of liked it. It's like some kind of graphic element that I didn't expect. I think it was probably a bird that moved. But I like this photo a lot better than what it really looked like. Zoomies, have you ever played with those? Any kind of uh, 30th of a second zooming the barrel of the lens in and out, um, in or out, I should say. And I just love what it does to lion's manes. It makes them look like they have crazy hair. Make a really sad lion. These are all handheld, just moving the camera down at a 30th of a second. Dogs. You guys are going to think I'm crazy. My favorite animal to photograph is wild dogs. African painted dogs, they have a lot of different names. Um, I find these guys beautiful. Um, you know, this was a misty, foggy morning. It was ISO 2500. You know, I barely had enough shutter speed to freeze them. You know, but I like this image because it has a feel to it. It, it is what it was. So the wild dogs, they, they have an alpha female. They hunt in packs. And just think about our dogs. Like, can you imagine them taking down one of these guys with the horns? No way. But these guys work together as a team. This was taken from a moving vehicle. Um, they took down three Impalas. I have those pictures. I don't usually show them. They're kind of not my style. But this is the poor guy looking at as a lioness takes away their kill. So what the wild dogs have to do is because they don't really have any way to defend themselves, right? They have to eat their prey really quickly. And that's kind of gross if you think about it, okay? They have to eat them quick because if the animal cries out, um, then it alerts all the other animals that their food. And lionesses and lions will come and just take away their food. So this guy's watching the lioness, I think. These guys are watching, they took down three impala, lion, lioness, they all came and stole their food. And usually you get photos of them like this. They're kind of bloody um, and dirty. But then when you see them when they're clean, you're like, oh my gosh, they're beautiful. This is just a pan with a vehicle while he was running probably a 30th of a second or so. They're super affectionate with each other. They usually come out in the mornings to hunt and in the evenings to hunt. In the middle of the day, they sleep. So we had a trip in... And my youngest went with me in March, and she had never seen wild dogs before. And I, you know, the light was getting low. I will shoot on a bean bag as the light gets low, and it's crazy. I'll have like a 600 millimeter lens, and I'll literally shoot at a 30th of a second. I can even go down to a tenth of a second. And if I'm shooting with a really high frame rate, I will still get sharp photos, which I think is ridiculous, right? Isn't that the greatest thing in the world that we have cameras that do this now? It's unbelievable. So we saw these dogs, and you know, it wasn't the greatest because these dogs, this is the alpha male and female of the, the pack, and they would not stop mating. And I have my daughter right next to me, and these dogs, just they, they will not stop, right? And, but we're following them because she's never seen them before, and I'm like, oh, look at the other dogs. They're cute. And then all of a sudden, these two turn, and they go to get a drink. And you know, I'd pretty much given up on photos at that point. It was so dark. And then this happened. And I think it's a lesson to all of us to, to not put down our cameras, to just keep trying at night because you never know when things are going to change, right? They went in front of here, and it's probably my favorite wild dog photo I've gotten. And it doesn't even show their beautiful colors, but it has a mood to it. Why do I like dogs so much? I have dogs. That was, this is me during the pandemic with my five dogs. Five dogs, four kids, three cats, you know. Um, and I love these guys. Now, unfortunately, all my kids are moving away and taking my pets with them. But this one stole my heart. Um, I got him from the shelter in 2019. He was 15 years old. They said he had like two months to live. He was deaf. He was partially blind. He was arthritic. I got him right before the pandemic. This dog 
walked with me like four miles a day during the pandemic. He had so much energy. His name was Champ. And I really wanted to get a good photo of him by the end of his life. He, he lived like two and a half years, by the way, not the two months the shelter thought. But that was the best photo I got of him on that log. And I'm like, it just, technically it's right. Everything's right about it. But it had no emotion and no feeling. And I think sometimes when we um, switch genres, right, in photography, we get kind of intimidated because it's not what we normally do. And so what I do in that case is I actually go to someone who's really good at that genre. So in this instance, it was Kaylee Greer. Um, from Dog Breath Photography. If you look up Dog Breath Photography, Hound Vision. Um, and she was doing a dog workshop, dog photography workshop, and I went out with her. And it kind of like reset my brain, right? So I came home. Oh, and I learned this technique, which I'm sharing with you because I think it's the super coolest thing ever. Okay, so you're photographing a dog. You're in your neighborhood. There's a crappy background with houses behind you. Okay, you use like say a 35 millimeter lens, 1.4. You take your iPhone, okay, make sure it's clean, and you hold it up underneath your lens, and you start playing around with the angle. And what will happen, there's no water in the scene, okay? That is just an iPhone reflection. And try it in your own photography, it's my tip for the day. Um, I've seen people do it at concerts too, if you're a big concert goer, you know, and you're with your spouse, you know, use your iPhone to shoot. Try to get somewhere in the middle of the stage. Doesn't matter really to how far back. And you put your phone here and you put their phone here. And what happens is you cut out all the people in front of you. So it looks like you're in the front row. And then if they're doing like a light show or something, then it all reflects in the iPhone. And it looks super, super cool. So I learned that there too. But I went home and like things clicked again. And this is the photo I got of my dog before he died. Well, the wildlife blind behind the scenes. These are from Texas. If you haven't shot birds or if you've shot them not from blinds, I'm telling you this is the way to go, OK? Um, they set up the perches. They put feeders, uh, food there. The birds come in. The backgrounds are fall. It's idiot proof. I love it. Some places have water features, which are also very cool. I'd really like one of those for my backyard. Um, these are all in Texas. I give you all the locations I talk about in the end if you guys want to know. Um, when I was there, a uh, black snake popped up in front of me in the blind. I'm like, okay. They said it was a very friendly snake. I forget what it was. It didn't, you know, it was like the good snake. My girlfriend was there a few days later and had the actual rattlesnake. So sometimes I think being from Ohio, we forget, right? <laughs> like, there is poisonous stuff out there. <laughs> Same thing here. These are low-key images, OK? I underexposed when I took these. I look for a bird in light. This is a roadrunner. And the green background goes dark when I underexpose. Green Jay, so easy now, right? And this bird was taking a bath. He hopped up on the perch. I took the shot. The background was a lot brighter than this. But now in Lightroom, I can go, bling, select background and darken it down. It's absolutely unbelievable what we can do now. I'm not really a big AI fan. I know you're talking about that. That kind of scares me. But this kind of stuff I love. Cardinal, um, that's a Feraloxia. And it's like one of my favorite birds. I feel like it has this tattoo going up its chest, you know? He's like the bad boy of the desert. Whoops. Oh, what was he? Oh, I have a friend who, who knows all her birds, and I do not. Thank you. You know who I always want to say when you say that? <laughs> Remember the actor from Police Academy? Bobcat Goldwith or something? Like, I think that's what always screws me up on this bird's name. <laughs> The same thing there, I underexposed it. It made the water drops um, stand out a bit more. And, and this became more about just a bird. It became about a lot of shapes. We have the circles of the water drops, you know, the oval of the bird. So you get into birds, then you get into hummingbirds, right? 
We have like one type of bird, hummingbird here, I believe it's the ruby-throated, which I love and I'm so happy when I see it. But then you hear that Ecuador has uh, 250 different varieties of hummingbirds. You're like, I gotta go to Ecuador. So I'm gonna say this is a wonderful trip to go on. Um, it's high altitude, the temperatures are really nice and cool. And if you're like me and you burn a lot, um, everywhere you go, they have covered shelters for you to shoot under, which is great. And they have crazy freaking hummingbirds. This is a sword-billed hummingbird. Uh, this is in the cloud forest of Ecuador. Yeah, and I mean, it will blow your mind. Um, they, you know, put the feeders and the perches far enough from the um, background that you get these beautiful backgrounds. And again, it becomes kind of like a video game. You're just trying to catch through really fast. Um, some of the lodges there, this is Birdwatcher's house, um, they actually put this tarp over it, which is wonderful because it's like a big giant softbox. Um, if you notice, see those little bananas up there? This is ingenious. They put the bananas and they have a, le a lever, right? And they lower them and they're by the perch and then the bird goes to the bananas and then they lift the bananas up so you get a clean shot without the bananas in it. Absolutely brilliant. Oh, hold on. Coronet. I think that now I have to use my notes. And of course now my notes aren't here. I think it was a coronet of some sort. That's what these guys are. But again, the backgrounds are absolutely ridiculous. Then Oh my gosh, you like totally blow my mind, right? You throw flash into the mix, okay? This is at Tan de Yapa Bird Lodge in Ecuador. This is our wonderful guide we had who his name was Alex, and he's injecting the flowers with the sugar, right? Absolutely brilliant, right? We can do this here with our ruby-throated hummingbirds. You know, you get an easel stand, you get your, you know, whatever 16 by 20 uh, 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 foam board back there. You set up four flashes about two to three feet away at 1 16th power, um, two on the background, two on the birds, right? And then the birds come. And they're absolutely stunning. This is a rocket tail. He actually, his little tail splits and he has two little paddles on it. And I really wish I could show you more hummingbirds, but I just did this trip in August <laughs> and I'm not through all the photos yet. But this will really blow your mind, okay? This is an in-camera multiple exposure with flash, okay? So what I love about shooting mirrorless and the Nikon Z9 is that when you shoot multiple exposure now, you can see the images in camera, okay? I don't know if other camera systems do this. I'm sure some of them do, especially if you're mirrorless. So what you do is you have that whole setup, you take a picture, and I got the two birds on the right in it, okay? They're well lit. I still see a faint ghost outline of them in the camera, okay? So I know where they were. This wasn't the case years ago with multiple exposure. Years ago, you had to guess. Um, so then I wait, and two more birds come in. And I did a three-frame multiple exposure, and so then the third single bird came in. Okay, I keep all the raw images, especially when you shoot on white. So I have all the raw images, but it's combining three images in camera into a JPEG, okay? You set, there's like a blend mode, and what happens is you set it to darken in your multiple exposure menu, and that will darken your hummingbirds down. So they actually are dark and not like ghost-like in each image. This is the out of camera image. And it's definitely got some problems, okay? He's got my perch in there. You know, this poor little guy down here, he's totally out of focus. He didn't make the cut, right? And when I do darken in that blend uh, mode for the multiple exposure, look, it does something funky to the, the plant, right? Because it's darkening it each time and it's staying in place. It's not just one, Im one frame of that image. But I shot on white. And we know all the tools we have in Lightroom now, right? I looked for another bird I had on white that was the same one and put that one in. 
and I took one of my single frames of the flower and put that in and got rid of that, that uh, uh, lamp that was in there. And this is what you come up with. And you know, it's, um, could I have come up with this on my own? No, it was a happy accident in camera, right? But now it's got my mind going to all the things I could do with these images because I shot tons of these birds on white, you know? Just amazing stuff. You know, I really liked when we went, which was August. Um, I think different times of the year, you, the year you get different types of birds. And I know January is like the rainy season. I don't think that really deters the hummingbirds, though. I think they're still there. So, but if you look on their, I'll give you the names in the end. They're there, and um, you can look on their website if you want the guide's name. I, and I actually went with Tom Bull um, photo workshops on that. He's like the bird expert that I know. So I can give you all that. All that info is on slides in the end. Um, iPhone power. Oops. That's taken with an iPhone. OK, iPhone 13 Pro Max with a macro feature. And he was just upside down, and I flipped the image, editing in my iPhone. Um, it's amazing what you can do now. A lot of wide angle shots and macro shots I actually shoot on my iPhone now. The best northern light display I've ever seen is on a plane, on a Delta Airlines plane from Anchorage to Minneapolis. And so what did I do? I had my iPhone out, and, and I just uh, took these out the window, and then I, um, there was kind of uh, reflections of the overhead lights in the cabin coming in, so I just put like um, the instruction videos of the pamphlet or whatever over that so those white lights didn't show up. I used to have a whole slide on time lapse, telling you how to do time lapse in your camera. You don't need it anymore. You just need a nice little holder for your, your phone, and you just set it going now. It's so easy. This is Mashatu in Botswana. There's a lot of elephants there. World of Wildlife travel tips. You know, I. <laughs> COVID was definitely interesting. Um, up here, this is my youngest and me in South Korea's airport in January of 2020. That airport, I think, is the busiest airport in the world. And as you can tell, we were there in 2020, <laughs> coming home, and there was no one. It was right around the co time COVID started. Um, the masks in the center, they are the most comfortable masks. If you're ever forced to wear a mask on a plane, I highly recommend those. You can sleep in them. They're wonderful. Um, again, wildlife photography is great. It's outside. It's so freaking safe. Um, and my husband just had COVID two months ago again, so it's still freaking around. It's horrible. Um, even around the gorillas, they now make you still wear masks. So you don't have to hike up um, with your mask on, but when you get to the gorillas, they give you masks to put on. Um, and, you know, we got stuck in Alaska. We were, there was a group before us, and they brought in COVID, and they gave COVID to the whole staff at the lodge we were staying. Only three staff members didn't have it, and we didn't have it. And they ended up putting um, one of the guides in a tent w out with the bears, so he wouldn't get it. So we'd have someone to go w out with. And the pilot, I think, was serving us dinner, and the next group couldn't come in, so we actually got a bonus week with the bears. <laughs> So, oh yeah, COVID definitely may, you know, I think I was in Africa and they sent a helicopter into the savannah to give you your COVID test to make sure you were okay to get on the flight to go back. I mean, it was, I think the first trip to Africa, we had 11 COVID tests from beginning to end and they did them every kind of way. Some of them did throat tests, some of them did nose tests. Nobody was on the same page. This travel tips, if you've seen me before, I definitely tell you about these every trip or every presentation. Um, new things, Apple Air tags, throw them in your luggage. I check, I carry two big lenses to Africa, and this is probably like, hopefully this doesn't get out, but <laughs> I always check one. Like I, I can't, I don't have enough weight to carry two on me, right? And so I always put an Air tag in there and an Air tag in my checked bag. And um, knock on wood, it's been totally fine. But Apple AirTags are wonderful things. Flighty is a super neat um, app. It links, I use TripIt 
to uh, document all my travel. And it tells you like your flights and uh, will match up with your friend's flights so you know when they're coming into places. But Flighty is super cool. It links with TripIt and combines all your travel so you can see where you've been, see how many times around the earth you've traveled. <laughs> and, uh, or it'll even, my daughter used to live in Savannah. So I flew to Savannah a lot. She used to go to SCAD. And uh, it's so funny because I've, it tracks how many times you've been on a certain flight. I've done the Cleveland to Atlanta flight 54 times. So <laughs> normal stuff, travel.state.gov, you know, get all your shots when you go somewhere. Um, I have different level of medical bags based on the travel destination I go to. John's really anal about me traveling, so I have like this giant duffel. I think it's the level three medical bag. And you know, it has a suture kit, it has like a bear wound kit, <laughs> like it has all this crazy stuff. Um, but I also carry, always carry a small Ziploc bag of Imodium and Motrin and like motion sickness pills on me if I'm out for the day, just in case, because you never know. This is some of my wildlife inspiration. Um, Kaylee Greer, dog photography. Michelle Valberg, she's amazing, she's out of Canada. Christy Odom, you've probably heard of, Joel Satori, Paul Nicklin, Art Wolf, Tom Bull, him and his wife Cree run trips, and I think they're the bird experts. <laughs> they do everything, but like I went on that Ecuador trip with them, it's mind blowing. This is my upcoming adventures. Um, our Cosplay 50 is going strong. Look at that, 31 states this year, and then we have that in Georgia and one more next year. Do you guys know Debbie DiCarlo? I love Debbie DiCarlo. We were members here at the same time. And I'm actually going, I went on this trip with her last year to the bayou in Texas. It's an amazing trip. Oh no, I've lost that. Oh, it's okay. It's, oh wait, no, I'm almost done and it's still working. It's all good. Um, I was getting too excited talking about Debbie. Um, but we're going to, uh, she's going to the Autumn Bayou in Texas. It's an uncertain Texas. It's like all those beautiful trees, it's fall colors and the mist coming up. It's an amazing trip. Um, if she has openings, look at it. Um, doing the Iditarod next year, I'm photographing uh, gannets. Um, going to Brazil for the first time and going underwater with humpback whales for my 50th birthday. These are recommended locations. Um, bird blinds, there's a couple in Texas, some in Ecuador. Places I love to go in Alaska, the polar bears. Um, Antarctica. Um, South Africa, Malamala is super good for cats. Pinda is good for cheetahs. Botswana is just amazing all over. If you like to see wild dogs, uh, Shatabe in Botswana. Mshatu is good for elephants. Pangolin is just super cool. You're on the river. Um, Jack's Camp, that's habituated meerkats. And Kenya, I just went um, and saw orphaned elephants at a Thumba hill, and that was a beautiful experience. And that's it. Why don't, we, why don't we leave that slide up for the people at home? Okay. And I'll turn the lights up. And if we have any questions, I'm going to hand you the mic so the people at home okay. uh, could, sit, could hear now. Anyone have any questions? Yeah, why don't we start at the back here? Hello. Alaska Bears, is that Brooks Falls? Um, you know, I've been to Brooks Falls, yes. But I stay at, um, uh, yeah, it's uh, in Katmai. It's, uh, gosh, no, actually, I can be smart about this. Hold on. We can go backwards. So it's Jock's Adventure Lodge. And what you do is you do um, fly in, fly out safaris. So, like, what they'll do is they'll take you to rivers and drop you off and then you walk down the river, and then usually like you do a day or two at Brooks Falls. Okay, because Brooks Falls, you have to take your own gear into, correct, if I remember right? I think so, yeah, yeah I know. So you're staying in a compound fence at Brooks Falls. Okay. Oh, I no, just... no, no, I wasn't, I've never stayed there. We just went in for day trips there. Okay, thank you. 
So, and that's really hard to get in into. Yeah, yeah I've heard about that. I also like um, uh, Silver Salmon Creek Lodge is, Lodge is great too in Alaska. Good food, and they take you out on these little carts to see the bears. So it's not as much hiking as like the Silver or the ja the, the Jerry's uh, Jack's Adventure Lodge. There's a lot of hiking. You had that one thing that we're showing the high points, I think. Is that what you call it? The high point? High, high key. High key, high key yeah. Key. Go through how you do that, please. Sure, sure. Um, you know, it depends on your workflow and how you want to do it. You can do it in camera. Um, say you shoot, you know, whatever, ever how you shoot, you're just increasing your exposure, right? Uh, aperture 40, you're plus two, plus three, somewhere in between there usually. And you're going to try to blow out your background, but keep detail in your subject if you're doing it in camera. Now, if you're doing it in post and you shoot raw, you can also do it that way. Um, and it's really easy in photo or in Lightroom or Photoshop, whatever you use, you just watch your, you know, put your highlights on. And then, you know, move your, usually what I do is I start with highlights and whites and then exposure. So if you do it straight with exposure, it's like taking a sledgehammer and it just does crazy stuff, right? And it looks horrible. But if you do very slowly and calculate it and do your, your highlights, bring them up, your whites and bring them up. And then if you need to, your exposure, usually you don't have to go there. That's how you can do it in post. And if you shoot raw, it definitely works. I don't know if you shoot JPEG if it works. Yes, any other questions? Um, when and where do you suggest to take pictures of big cats? Oh, big cats. Lions? Um, leopards, cheetahs. Leopards, cheetahs, cheetahs. It's definitely, um, and again, this is all you know, up to how wildlife feels, right? <laughs> but uh, cheetahs, we said Pinda Forest Lodge is cheetahs. I really like Mala Mala in South Africa um, for lions. Um, another one, Mambo is great. Botswana is great for leopard. Um, but yeah, Mala Mala is a really great camp too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep, we had another question over here. Can you just quickly speak to um, how you get the quick shot? It, how much of the time is it that you are like setting up for the background and everything else and just ready for whatever happens versus you are uh, preparing for something that you're hoping to happen versus having like preset buttons to be ready for whichever right. thing? So, so as far as like exposure goes, what I've been doing is I've been shooting on manual mode, okay? in auto ISO with wildlife. And I set my shutter speed, you know, whatever, five and 800 lens, usually I'm at 800, it, it depends on light, you know, get the lowest ISO you can when you can. Um, the, uh, and then aperture, I'm always at a low aperture. So those are kind of my settings and those are up on my camera at every time. So then, and I usually try to always remember to zero out exposure comp. If you're using exposure comp, that always screws people up. Um, I'm a really patient person. Um, I like to be ready with those settings, and if we see something, I pull up and do it, right? But I will sit with something for three hours. Like, I am ridiculously patient if I think something's gonna happen. And I don't know, sometimes that's a good thing and sometimes that's a bad thing, right? Um, does that answer your question? Yep, any other questions? No, well, Susan, we, we, they're absolutely just stunning images, just unbelievable. And uh, we, we thank you very much. Yeah. And we hope to, when you work on those August pictures, we hope to have you back. I know, if you guys ever want to uh, hear like more in depth on anything yes. or something like that, feel free. I, I feel like I kind of cram a lot in and I just babble, but like, you know, just tell me what, oh, you, but it's, what it's you want and it. what you need and I can come in. We will definitely be calling you back then. Cool. Good, so thank you Thanks. very much. Thank you all for coming.